webinar, so that's going to start the recording, just so you know. Thank you. Hi, Stephanie. Hi. But folks should be joining shortly. <laughs> Excuse me, Stephanie, I'll give you a heads up. I have COVID, so okay. I may have difficulty speaking from time to time. I was diagnosed a few days ago. I'm actually feeling a lot better today. So this is the first thing, work thing I'm doing since I got it, but I might find it difficult to speak, in which case I'll just shut up. Okay. Um, I, yes, I've been there, so. <laughs> and I, I worked through it as well, but you, you kind of do get tired for sure. Yes. The end of the day is tough for me. Mm -hmm. The mornings have been not, not so bad, but the end of the day is tough. So I'll, I'm sure I'll be done after this call. Yeah. Hmm. Well, we may cut this one a little bit short. We don't have to go. I, I had given us two hours because I couldn't remember if we said an hour or two hours for this particular meeting. So I gave us two hours, but you know we can cut it short if we need to. I have a couple of follow-up questions from our last meeting, and I don't know if it's appropriate to ask them in this meeting or, uh, or, or schedule a different meeting, but I thought I'd throw it out there. I guess it depends on what your questions are. Why don't we wait <laughs> until we get everybody here? <laughs> okay. Fair enough. So I know we need Chris, at least, to get the meeting started. Tom said he would attend, but not until later. So once Chris arrives, we can get going. And I will note um, for those of you who just arrived that the recording, when I open the meeting, the recording starts automatically. So um, we are recording, just be aware. Well then I'll be careful what I say. <laughs> Darcy, it looks like you were trying to say something, but you're muted. Oh, you're still, there you go. Just looking for our agenda so I can put it in the notes. Is it in, was it in one of those emails? Yes, I sent it. I can always add it if, you know. Okay, it just is easy to it. take the notes when it's in that framework. Sure, do you want me to forward it to you? Uh, if it's easy, if you can find it easily, I, I uh... just give me one moment. Hi, Chris. Hi, Chris. Can I throw out the, uh, the question and then you can all decide whether or not you want to address it today or wait till some other time? Sure. Now that Chris is here. Uh, Chris, I, I said that I had a question that remained from uh, last week's or, or last time we met. And the question is, um, you know, I, I have to confess that I don't understand the um, electricity purchasing market. But I assumed that when you went out to buy electricity that you could choose what kind of electricity you wanted because there are so many suppliers that they must offer different products. 
Um, but the last time uh, in our last meeting, I mentioned that we wanted to purchase renewable energy generated electricity as part of our mix. And it would, the suggestion came up that we would need a PPA. And I didn't understand why we would need to go to a PPA model um, uh, unless I really don't understand, which is entirely possible, the electricity market. Um, well, so that, well, let me ask first, Stephanie, did, do you want to address that question now? We could talk about, so certainly as far as we're concerned, we could talk about it for a few minutes. Um, I think we could spend a few minutes. Chris, you're muted. I think I could answer it, Paul, but I think you'd probably be better at answering it. Well, I, I don't know for sure, but I could take a first crack and then you and Kim too, I know, could help to um, clarify. Great. So your, your, your question is a good one. And um, I think the, the high level response is that there are lots of different ways of purchasing renewable energy. And depending on how you want to do it, you would, you have different options and you would do it in different ways. So the core way in New England, the, by far the most common way that people purchase renewable electricity and the way our electricity market is designed is you actually buy the energy and the renewable content of it separately. And the, they're, they've been divided into separate products and you buy the energy as energy and you buy the renewable energy content as RECs, which are renewable energy certificates, which are developed by renewable generators. And to clarify what I say you buy, in the case of an aggregation, what it would mean is the, the retail supplier you choose for the aggregation would buy those two things. And in particular, in the, they buy all the electricity you need and the whatever mix of RECs you tell them you want. So that's the that's the core way to do it here. And for that, you don't need a, a PPA. You can use just a standard retail contract and that's the way all or virtually all aggregations do it now. Mm -hmm. There is an argument though, that while that's good, there are other things you could do that would do more to support development of renewable ener new renewable energy than that model I just described does. And we can, and other ways would include entering into a contract with a particular renewable generator. And for the reason that if you enter into a direct contract with a new renewable generator, you can say, and you would as a, as a community, you'd be responsible for helping that project get built because you've made a commitment to a particular generator. Mm -hmm. But to get that part, you were responsible for it getting built, you need to enter into a long-term contract because if you just enter into a typical, the typical term of a normal retail supply contract, which might be two years, for example, that's not a long enough commitment for the renewable generator to get built. So if you want to take that next step, you need to enter into a longer term contract and form enter a, will be a PPA or there's also something called the virtual power purchase agreement, the VPPA, which we can talk about separately, but that's that's really the main divide. Are you buying electricity in Rex, which is the way 99.9% .9 of the people do it, or do you want to do something that goes a little deeper? If so, that requires a different kind of commitment. I, I could throw a specific example out that I think could be clarified. So the city uh, had a three megawatt array built on our landfill. And we have a power purchase agreement. So in that, as, as Paul said, it produces two products. It produces electrons and it produces a societal benefit. So in that societal benefit, we have quantified um, in Massachusetts and other places as RECs. So um, <clears throat> uh, it's worth something. Uh, and so what happens at that landfill right now is um, um, in order to make the finances work, the owners of that land, of the PV array on the landfill, Amoresco, they sell the SRECs. So they make an income from that. And whoever buys those SRECs can say, I am using electric, uh, renewable energy. <clears throat> on the other hand, we buy the net metering credits, which gives us a really good economic um, benefit. But we can't say we're using renewable energy. David Narkowitz, Mayor Narkowitz hated it when I pointed that out, that we are not providing most of our power through renewable energy, even though we bought this, we built this beautiful array 
out on our landfill, making good use of a landfill space, and we're but they're selling off the wrecks. And so normally, what you do when you buy go out for power purchase, not power purchase groups, when you go out to buy electricity, you're buying RECs or SRECs. So you're buying the right to say that that renewable energy that's being produced there, that's mine. I'm paying for it. <clears throat> and I think last week I remember there was some kind of conversation about us wanting to build a project locally. So so something that actually exists in our territories. And in that case, if you really want to support it whole hog, as Paul was saying, then you have to buy both products. You'd have to buy the Rex or the smart credits, or whatever they do nowadays. I'm not even sure I understand the smart program. Um, but you basically have to buy the right to the renewable energy so that utilities can't buy it. You're buying it because utilities buy all that stuff. That's where most gets bought. Um, and you buy the power and you can't directly connect the array um, I mean, if you, if you raise behind some meter, then you've got to directly connect it. Now you're getting the electrons. Um, wonderful. But if it's separate, then you can't tell the electrons, you know, take a left at Main Street and go down. <laughs> you won't do it. So you buy, you, you buy net meter and credits instead. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you so much, Paul and Chris. Um, that was a, a wonderful mini tutorial. I'm glad we have it recorded. <laughs> so, um, okay, well, because Tom is not going to be able to join us now, I'm going to skip uh, reviewing the minutes. We'll just go um, right to updates. I don't think we have any updates. At least I don't. Does anyone else have any updates? Okay, so then let's go right into our discussion. And I sent around to everyone the outreach and education plan forwarded by Marlena. Thank you so much. Um, and we can start with looking at that document. Um, Marlena, do you want to share or do you want me to share my screen? Um, either either way, um, if, if you want to structure the conversation and control the scrolling, you're, you're welcome to share or I can share and you can tell me where you want to look. Um, well, I guess I was sort of um, hoping to look to you to sort of guide us through. Um, so I can, if you want to talk and I'll scroll, <laughs> how's that? Okay, sure. Um, hold on one moment and I'll, I just had it. Okay, so if you'll bear with me a moment while I share my screen. Okay, I'm assuming you can all see that now? Yes. Okay. So well, Marlene, go ahead. I'll, yeah, you'll just, well, you can launch. Well, no, so it's pretty heavily annotated to explain it all. So I don't know if everybody had an opportunity to look at that. Um, what, what would be helpful? Uh, I don't wanna like repeat something. If you guys have already read the annotations, I don't wanna just like repeat something you've already read. So what would be the most helpful thing? Well, I think if we just sort of scroll through maybe, um, if you could just just give a, give a quick um, snapshot of you know the pieces where we really need to um, you know weigh in. I mean, maybe not sort of the general information, but maybe some of the timing, some of the additional information that we could add. So if I just sort of start by the beginning, I can't see people um, while I'm sharing my screen, I can't see you all very easily. So I would just say that if someone has a question as we go through, just speak up and stop, you know, stop us and we'll ask the question and then we can continue. Does that sound okay for folks? Sure. Yeah, I could, I could say one place that I would kind of focus on. Well, I mean, I think the idea of an overview is good. Um, but if there's any place I want, I would want to focus on, my brain would want to go to right away would be, what are the next steps? Right. What Which are the first steps? Yeah. That, maybe, that's, that's, maybe that's what you were saying, Stephanie. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's mine too. I just, but that's why I wanted, um, I thought it would be good for Marlena to just sort of give an overview and then we can maybe focus on the real next steps. Does that sound okay, Marlena? Sure. Um, so just at, at a high level, the next step is to complete this document. That is, that is the next step that I would recommend uh, you folks work on. Um, and, and throughout the document, you'll see there are areas where 
you need to explain exactly the details of the types of outreach that are gonna happen, including names of organizations, things like that. So that's specifically where you folks will need to weigh in and help fill in those blanks. So if we start kind of what we're looking at on the screen now, you'll see there's an, an introductory section and then the first big chunk matches up to where we are right now, which is the aggregation plan development period. And, and generally this document is structured to match this, the phases of aggregation development um, review and, and launch. So <clears throat> this is where we are now, we're in the aggregation development period. And you might recall from our first conversation that the big milestone we're headed toward when we first start working on a program is the public presentation of the aggregation plan. So the aggregation plan and also documents like this education outreach plan and a couple other things have to be presented to the public for comment and review for a 30 day period before they can be submitted to the DPU. So this first section here in the document addresses what is the outreach that's gonna happen there. And what I include here are kind of the typical things that would be expected, typical and minimum bar that would be expected for any community. Um, so this is where I would need you guys to fill in, like what are the local newspapers? What are the social media accounts? If you can believe it, the DPU actually cares about which social media accounts. And if we don't list them, they will come back and say, list which, is it Facebook or is it Twitter? For some reason that's important to them. Um, if there are other ways to publicize this public presentation of the plan and the public comment period, we would want to list those as well. The caveat I will always offer with this document is that whatever it, we put in here is the minimum that you'll be committed to when, um, when we're actually doing the work. So you can never do less than, than what's in this document, but we can always do more. So I don't recommend that we need to kill ourselves to put in every little tiny possible detail. What we really wanna do is put enough in here so that the DPU and the public feel confident that outreach is being taken seriously and that it reflects the particular needs of each community. So if there's something, for example, that works in Amherst, but it doesn't work in Pelham, we would wanna say, we'll do this in Amherst, we'll do this in Pelham, we'll do this in Northampton, that kind of thing. So I would envision this section and any section where we're listing things, we might have a few items that we do across all communities, and then we might have a few things that are community specific also, and we would specify which is which. So that's that will need to be filled in here. Um, if you scroll down a little bit past there, you'll see next we move into the regulatory review period section of the document, which is also what we move into after we submit everything to the state regulators. So then we will be in the regulatory review period. There is not a DPU requirement that outreach has to happen in this period of time, the same way there is around the public presentation of the plan and then later around launch. So this middle period is really left up to the communities to decide what they wanna do and if they want, well, really if they wanna do anything and if so, at what scale. So it may be that you folks don't want to do a lot of outreach in this intervening time, but if you do want to do anything, we would want to explain it in this part of the document. Typically what communities will say here is what I have put. Typically communities will say during this time, we'll endeavor to try to start doing some outreach and you list the organizations that that outreach will be done to. The DPU always wants as many specifics as possible. I like to use words like endeavor to, uh, as you might imagine that gives you a little bit of wiggle room. So if we don't actually uh, get around to it or it doesn't work out for some reason, it's not a big deal. Um, and so in here, you would list the organizations. If, for example, if this is what you wanna do, you would list the organizations and you would list um, what kinds of outreach you might want to do. If you don't want to do this, we should not put it in. I'll, I'll, I'll be clear about that as well. Um, there is some requirement here that during this period, we just have to have uh, links available on the municipal websites to the documents that have been submitted to the DPU. So that's that last paragraph that 
you see on the screen there, but it says to ensure access. So that's just required language. Um, that's the only thing that's required in this period. It's not really so much outreach as it is just making the documents publicly available. The DPU is always concerned with transparency. So that's, that's the regulatory review period. It's very flexible, very much up to you folks. Whatever you wanna do, we should put here. Whatever you don't wanna do, we don't put there. Um, then the next section of the document is really just in order to make the document make sense. There's no outreach around signing the electricity supply contract. It's just the next step after regulatory approval is received. And the document doesn't make a lot of sense if we leave that out. Um, I'm remembering this document is both written for regulators and also for the public. So the electricity supply contract text just says, this is the next thing that happens. Moving beyond that into section D is the formal uh, public education and outreach period. And that's a section or a period that the DPU really cares about. And as a reminder, that's the period of time between when your electricity supply contract is signed and when your program launches. So that's the point at which you have all your program details like price, renewable energy, content, who your supplier is, how long the prices are locked in for, and even when your program's going to launch. So at that point, that's when the automatic enrollment notification mailing goes out. And that is something everybody has to do. And that's uh, included here. And then there are other DPU requirements, like you have to do public information sessions um, and trying to think what else. I think those are the two big requirements that they officially talk about, but everything else I put in here is kind of the minimum that people would expect at this point. Oh yeah, so the announcement as well. So it has to be posted on the website. The announcement has to be sent out to local media publications, um, those kinds of things. So what I've got here, is kind of a combination of the minimum bar and also the typical way people meet that minimum bar. Very often this section is very similar to what's in section A, what you do around the um, public presentation of the plan. This is just a little bit more robust than what's in section A. For section A, when you're publicly presenting the plan, we have one presentation. Um, we don't have a series of presentations. There's no mailing that goes out. So it, it, and, and it's also a time when you have less program details. So the amount of outreach is often tempered down a little bit. Um, but many of the same avenues might be used like the municipal website, like sending announcement out via social media or to the local paper, things like that. So you'll see there will be some parallels between those two sections, but this is the part where the DPU will really expect it to be more amplified. So more outreach here. Um, as much as we can put in with confidence that you'll be able to do it whenever this program launches, that's what we want to include. If you have a question about whether it will be feasible or in existence or uh, desirable, we shouldn't include it because again, you can't do less than what's in here, but you can always do more. Um, so this is the typical structure of what I would include. So for example, if you wanna work with um, agencies and organizations in the community, we need to list who they are, some exemplar organizations. If we are gonna send anything to faith-based organizations, we should list exemplar organizations, um, things like that. So you'll see that's wherever the brackets are and there's capital letters, that's an opportunity for you folks to weigh in. If there's anything that's not on this list that you would want to do, for example, we had one community that has a big electronic billboard on the side of, um, Gosh, I don't even know which highway it is, but one of the major routes, they have access to it. Um, that's not a typical thing, but it was unique to them. So we put it in here. So, you know, big electronic billboard sign. If you guys wanna do things like A-frame signs around the community, things like that, we can add that. Yard signs, we can add that. Um, again, just whatever you wanna put in here is gonna be what you're confident in. Um, scrolling down a little bit more, you'll see the program website. We have to describe what's gonna be there this is a very standard list of what we include when we provide the program website. It's got a lot of ability for customers to self-service through the website. Um, I mean, this, this is just, a, it's a very standard list. So it's not necessarily something that you need to weigh in on. Um, but of course, if you have requests around the website, we can discuss that. Following that, there's the coming soon postcard. This is not something that's required by the DPU, but it's something that we do and we recommend doing it. So I've included it in here. So I mentioned the mailing that goes out to everybody that's gonna be automatically enrolled, the notification mailing. We recommend sending a coming soon postcard out a week or so before that. 
And that really just primes people to keep an eye out for this letter and reduces the number of people that complain later, oh, this happened and nobody told me. So the coming soon postcard just draws attention to the fact that the automatic enrollment letter is coming. So that's something that we just build into our planning and I went ahead and added it to this. If it's something you don't want for some reason though, we're free to take it out. It's not a DPU requirement. And then item three there is the automatic enrollment uh, notification letter that I mentioned. So the opt out, the DPU calls it the opt out letter. So we have to use their language in this document. Um, so it's the opt out letter, which is mailed by your supplier and paid for by your supplier. And then the public education events, so in general, um, most communities do two events, one generally and one for seniors. I started with that, um, but it may be we want to do a different combination since there are three of you working together. The way I wrote it, it assumes uh, six, so two in each community. I don't know that that's necessarily a requirement though. I was just trying to make a guess at what might work for you folks, but it may be that you want to do, uh, you know, two in the larger communities and one in Pelham because it's a smaller community, something like that. In general, the way to think about this, though, is that um, you want to definitely put emphasis on uh, seniors. So if there is an ability to do a special session for seniors, you'll want to include that. And then also something general for the community. Again, you can do more than two. So if you're thinking, well, two's not enough, we're gonna wanna do some special outreach to agencies that support various groups within the community, uh, or we wanna do two general outreach sessions in addition to seniors, we can definitely do that. This is just kind of a, a place to start here. And Marlena, I have a question for this sure. section. Could we, because I was looking at the numbers in terms of folks who don't speak English, we have Spanish and uh, Chinese seem to be the two primary other languages. Is it possible to do sessions just in those languages? Uh, yeah, we could hire um, an interpreter to help deliver those sessions, sure. Andra has her hand up, so go ahead, Andra. Yeah, I was curious why um, seniors in particular and rather than renters. Well, seniors are often, uh, there, there's a large portion of seniors that are often in the low income bracket. And in general, the low income electricity customers are often the ones that are negatively impacted, disproportionately neg negatively impacted by predatory uh, competitive supplier marketing. Um, and also seniors often struggle to understand these programs. So those two things combine to make them a really important audience for a program like an aggregation. It's important that they understand that it's a resource um, so that they can get away from high prices from electricity supply contracts. And it's also important that they have a little bit of extra time to understand the program in general. If so anyone if else to, let's say if you wanna do special outreach to renters, um, you can certainly you can certainly do that um, if you can figure out a way to corral them. Yep. Anyone else have any questions for the section? Um, I'll, I'll just chime in, not with a question, but just with one further response, Stephanie, to your question about doing presentations in other languages. And you mentioned both Spanish and Chinese. Um, we, we could certainly check with your community, but it might be that whereas a Spanish language presentation would be helpful, a Chinese language one might not be needed. What we found elsewhere is that while in a lot of communities, there are a significant number of people who speak Chinese, generally they're in families where someone is very, very capable in English. Um, you know, it's a different, often a, a different kind of immigrant population. So we might find that the, the Chinese, people who speak Chinese don't need the translation as much as maybe people in, uh, who speak primarily Spanish or some other language might. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Stephanie. Darcy, go ahead. Um, just wondering what we do about, um, it looked like Amherst was the community that has a lot of international folks from a lot of different countries. And there were there was a smattering of a whole bunch of different languages, just wondering, what we do about that. 
um, if there's five people who can only speak Polish or, I mean, I, I understand that there might be somebody in their family that can speak English, but how do, how do we find that out? I think it's more how we translate it, the materials that we provide and the information that we provide is I think typically how the town's done it um, when getting information out. Um, right, but but we how, could, does that, how does that, how does that serve someone who only speaks Polish? In pro being provided materials in Polish? Yeah. Um, I think what we've done is, you know, usually we'll go through organizations. Um, you know, there's a few organizations that work with the immigrant population that's available to us and we typically would outreach to them. So, I mean, that's a discussion we can dive into deeper. I was looking more at the sort of the larger groups. Uh, we, you know, there's no doubt that we tend to cater to the sort of the larger group. When we, when we drill down to really small numbers, um, I don't think there's as much of an effort to specific meeting those specifically meeting those needs. I feel like in this case we we need to. Um, so we can we can have that conversation later. I just want to make sure that there's opportunities for some of these bigger groups to have, I, we wouldn't have a big, large meeting and information session for five people. You know, maybe there might be some outreach with a community member who is bilingual that we could go to somebody's house and invite people. You know, we might do something more small and intimate and we might do that on our own somehow separately, I don't know. So um, I'm talking more about these larger meetings would be for bigger groups of folks. And so that's why I was wondering about like a Spanish session, uh, Spanish speaking session. I'll, I'll also add there, um, the website that we create, they, they have machine translation available um, from a drop down. So that's just kind of built in. Oh, in addition, in, in addition, the automatic enrollment letter that goes out is accompanied by a DPU required cover sheet that's in 26 different languages. And the, the 26 languages all say the same thing, which is this is really important. Be sure to get somebody to help you translate it if you don't understand. So that's a DPU requirement. Um, it doesn't mean that the letter itself is translated into Polish, but it, at least there is something that draws people's attention to it and says, don't ignore this, go get, go get some help. So those, those things are already built in to how this works for everybody. Kind of everybody in the state does that. And the town's website, Darcy, just because I know you're concerned about Amherst, does have um, translation also similar. It has a, an ability to choose a language and the entire site is in that language. Does it actually work? My understanding is it is. I haven't <laughs> specifically used it, but I have spoken with the IT director and I've watched her navigate, put it on and, you know, cool. shown other languages. So that's good. Uh, anybody does else? It, does it make sense also to just to mention the translation through the, um, the customer helpline? Oh, yes. Thank you, Paul. I did think of that and it went right out of my head. Um, so Paul's right. The one other piece is that our customer support um, through our customer support line, we have access to on-demand interpreting in at least 200 languages. So if people call, so they get this cover sheet with the letter and the cover sheet says, this is important, you should get it translated. And at the top, there's a phone number, which is our customer support phone number. So if they call us and they ask for a language, we get an interpreter on the phone right then. And we do this all the time. Uh, so we have a lot of experience with that too. So people that have, uh, that, that are members of language populations that are smaller, so they're not on the receiving end of translated marketing materials, for example, um, they can still call and have a conversation with us. That's great. Wonderful. Anybody else? Okay, then I guess we can keep going. Um, okay, so I think just scrolling down. Um, yeah, so the timeline. So this is something the DPU started requiring recently and it's a challenge. Um, so what their requirement is that the timeline has to show each thing that's in the list above. 
So everything you say you're going to do, you got to show in the timeline when you're going to do that. And this, I'll be honest, this is really tough because we just don't know in advance, you know, 18 months in advance, when are you going to schedule a select board meeting or when are you going to schedule a public information session or, or anything else or when are social media posts going to be done? So this is meant to be illustrative, as it says, and the reason I say that in the header and also I say it again in the second sentence of the paragraph is because um, we just wanna build in some wiggle room here so that the DPU understands that, the, that you folks are making your level best attempt to take your commitment seriously and lay it out in a timeline to show that it's really gonna happen and it's gonna happen far enough in advance of the enrollments that people are gonna be able to use the information, which I think is one of the DPU's concerns. But this is really very much guesswork. And I don't think we need to tie ourselves in knots necessarily to try to get this just right. Um, so I guess that's, you'll see what I've done is I try to pull in all the things that were in the list above. If we add anything to that list, we need to add it here. Um, it's a pretty aggressive timeline. It may be that things don't happen quite this quickly or they happen in a slightly different order. And I don't think that would be a problem. I don't, I don't see the DPU, I don't know how they would do this, pulling out a list of things that the town has done and comparing it to this timeline. There would be no mechanism for them to do that. So the real, I think, goal here is just to show the DPU that these efforts are gonna happen in time for people to use them before the opt-out deadline. Um, and to show that the, you know, the town is serious about, or towns are serious about incorporating these, uh, these ideas into the outreach. Um, so if we scroll past that, um, standard text. So then after program launch, this section has a lot of DPU required language in it. You folks are free to, and I would encourage you to do uh, outreach efforts after launch to keep the programs visible in the community. And we help with that on an ongoing basis. We're always sending over social media graphics around various things, um, you know, helping you write announcements is if you want to write announcements or draw attention to the program. Your programs are always gonna have perennial competition from other electricity suppliers and people will forget even that they're enrolled and, and go sign up for some new agreement. So you wanna do that all the time the DPU has its own focus for this section. So there's just a lot of stuff here that's DPU required. And so you'll see that's, that's what this section is fundamentally about, is just satisfying the DPU that after the program launches, you're gonna meet their requirements around uh, the outreach obligations. That's what this section is really about. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily recommend doing a lot more in there, but if you, if you want to make a public commitment to something, you know, some other kind of marketing on an ongoing basis, you're welcome to do it, but there's no requirement to. And, and you can do ongoing marketing without making a commitment to it in this document. Again, you can't do less, but you can always do more. So typically this section of the document is just full up with, um, with DP requirements. Just a note about one that's always perplexing to people is as you're scrolling down here, you'll see this section about disclosure labels. So I should say a, a few words about what that is because nobody knows what that is. So these are documents that are, any of us might, might be familiar with from the utilities. It's a document that describes among other things, the sources of the electricity supply that you receive and associated emissions. The documents are a requirement for electricity suppliers. They have to create these, they're supposed to create them quarterly. And that includes the utilities. The utilities mail them quarterly to us. They include them in our bills. So you may have seen something like this in your bill. Aggregations get an exemption from that mailing requirement in exchange for committing to publicize them via alternative means that are supposed to be as equal to a mailing as you can get. In the past, the DPU was kind of content to just let people say, yeah, we'll do something. Now they're diving into it. They're concerned that this document, which can be fairly opaque, I'll be honest, they're concerned that this document is not, you know, people aren't taking it seriously enough. So they want this education and outreach plan to articulate a robust 
commitments to publicizing these labels on a quarterly basis. And by label, it's a PDF file, one or two pages, sometimes more, um, designed by the electricity supplier to meet their best understanding of DPU requirements, which means it's by their attorneys. They're not consumer friendly, um, I'll be honest, but they're, they, the suppliers are on the hook to, to develop and deliver them. And then the communities are on the hook to publicize them. And we have to report to the DPU that publicity. So this is this list here is what I or what we understand as the minimum expectation from the DPU right now for what will be done on a quarterly basis. Um, there is a line in there like announcement on municipal cable access. If you have that, if you don't have a cable access channel, then we wouldn't include that. But the minimum requirements are they need to be available low tech. So on just on bulletin boards. The DPU does expect them on the, like the municipal website and not buried. Um, so you'll see there's a note there about the home page and then social media um, and then on the program website, which we take care of. So um, if you guys want to see what those look like, I can send you links from some that are in active programs right now, but, but that's what that's all about. Um, and then the next section is what we were talking about before, which is uh, vulnerable community members. So the DPU requires a lot of census data. I already did the homework for you there. Um, so that's all included. And then there's a section after this where you, if you keep scrolling, you describe the um, actual outreach that will be done or the accommodations that will be made for folks who struggle with English. So um, I think there's also a section if we keep scrolling on accommodations for uh, people who might need um, ASL interpreter, that kind of thing as well. So this is this is that section where we address the concerns that you raised earlier, which is how to make sure people who are not proficient in English or who are otherwise uh, struggling to understand, make sure that they have equal access to information. And I think that is the end of the documents. I think the last part is just the original data, which we have to attach as well. Um, so I think I think that's kind of the overview. All right. Thank you so much, Marlene. I really appreciate your taking the time to go through that with us. Um, and I did read it, but actually hearing you um, speak through it more really uh, was helpful. So does anyone have any specific questions before we move on to next steps? Yeah, I have, I have a question. Go ahead, um, Chris. Uh, are there any similar communities to Northampton and Amherst or Pelham that we could go talk to that have done a good job? So, I mean, basically, is there a good example out there? <clears throat> now, you guys work with many communities, so I'm just wondering if... Uh, uh, for outreach or yeah, yeah, there's someone who's done a really good job at outreach. They've been creative, they've been engaged, they, they, they have lessons learned, and we might want to strike up a conversation with them. Well, we always point people to Newton. Um, okay. They, they, I mean, their, their program launched a few years back before this education and outreach plan document was even required. Um, it, Newton was very committed to running a robust campaign that started long before they had DPU approval. Um, whether anybody could possibly match what, what Newton did, it was really an astonishing amount of work they put into it. I don't know. Um, but Ann Berwick is, is definitely the person to talk to about outreach efforts. I, okay. I think they've, they've been the most robust of any community that we've worked with. Um, we're working with like since, since this document was required, we haven't launched any communities. Um, prior, to, prior to this document, anybody else that had a robust launch? I'm trying to think of who else went as far. I mean, Newton is just so far out and above everybody that we've worked with by miles from an outreach perspective around their launch. I don't know, Paul, am I, can you think of anyone who might be comparable? I mean, I know other communities have done outreach, but They've all been very, it's all been very similar. Yes, there's other. one other community I was thinking of, but I'm, I don't know if you'd agree, Marlene, it might be Lincoln, which is a very small community, um, very different, 
they did a lot of outreach too. a lot of yard signs was was big for them, which got a lot of attention and a lot of their outreach was around um, convincing people to opt up to the optional 100% green product and they got um, the a very high percentage of that or high compared to everybody else so everybody else is around 1% opt up and uh, Lincoln is over 10 I think so still a small percentage but much higher than is typical. It, so that, that's an interesting idea, Paul. And just for your folks reference, Lincoln and Newton used us in different ways when it came to outreach. So that's one of the reasons Lincoln didn't jump right to my mind. So Newton used us a lot for help with materials and, and things. Lincoln is um, their, their committee is the driver behind their program and the committee members really didn't want us to create materials because they wanted to do it. It gave them a sense of satisfaction and um, I offered and they said, no, we, every time we try to have somebody else come in and make materials, our committee members get frustrated with us because they wanna, they wanna do the stuff themselves. So they did a lot of very grassrootsy stuff. Um, as Paul said, they did their own yard signs. They, I know they sent a lot of emails. Lincoln's a very small community. So I think there's a lot of just networking within the community of, of people who knew each other or who knew someone who knew someone. Um, that kind of grassroots outreach, grassroots outreach um, which is a little bit different from Newton, which really took um, more of a broad brush approach. So in Newton, there was a lot of meetings with community agencies and organizations. It's a city, there are a lot of those, um, as well as you know, city departments. And then also we created outdoor signs and banners and things you know, to put out throughout the community visibly. Um, Lincoln was the yard signs, but then I think, I think everything else was done by a conversation one way or another, electronic or in person. So if you talk to them, you would get two really different approaches which might be useful given the diversity of the you know among the three communities that you have you might actually get a nice well-rounded perspective so good idea well, before Catherine, Catherine jumps, has, okay go let, ahead, let, me, let me jump in with a follow-up question just before so you you just told me what Lincoln's success was which is wonderful you know um what was New, Newton's success so they had this huge outreach program did it produce something yes yeah, so before Lincoln launched Newton was the state leader in opt-ups Yes. Opt ups. Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay. Very good. Thanks. Yep. And and I, I'd also add there, Chris, I think in some ways the real um, measure of success of extensive outreach is that residents make an informed choice about whether or not to participate. And that's a that measure of success is a very difficult thing to measure. So you know, there, there isn't necessarily a, a, a number you can put on it, but we certainly feel like the, the more people understand the program and can decide understanding the program, whether they want to be in it or not, that's real success, but it is, it's hard, it's hard to measure. Okay, great. <clears throat> Catherine, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to add that um, <clears throat> everybody knows that I've been monitoring the work for, you know, all the time that you guys have been doing it largely to share with the rest of the region, but especially the city of Springfield, because the city of Springfield has been funded by the Kresge Foundation to advance two policies through the Kresge Foundation's Climate Change Health Equity Initiative, and they've settled on a community choice aggregation. They're calling it community choice energy. And so there's been two years already of education. So this is all funded not by the city to the city government, it's advocacy groups, it's the Public Health Institute, and then the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission Arise for Social Justice, Neighbor to Neighbor, and Wayfinders are all part of this collaborative under the Livewell Springfield umbrella. And so they've been doing two years of outreach to um, black and brown residents in the city in particular to do all the grassroots behind the scenes work to build the understanding um, and support for you know, going to 100% renewable when the city finally moves on community choice energy. So right now the, the team has hired Open Pixel and is making a little video we had a, a hour long you know, Zoom webinar on what is community choice energy with a bunch of resident leaders that have been joining us for a year, for two years. And they've been doing, we gave them scripts and they've been doing neighbor to neighbor, you know, family member outreach. So you can get all those materials. They're not up yet, but they will be up on the Livewell Springfield website. Um, they're just finally getting loaded. They're behind on all that. But 
And then you can reach, I mean, I can connect you with Samantha Hamilton at the Public Health Institute of Western Mass if you need any of those materials. So there is, they're obviously, Springfield's different size than, than all, of, all of the three of you, but there are a lot of materials that have been developed, you know, locally for this kind of thing. That's terrific. Great, thank you, Catherine. Okay, other questions? All right, so I guess we're going to launch right into next steps. Um, so, and it looks like, you know, going back to the beginning of the document, sort of the, the beginning of the outreach resources uh, that we would utilize seems to be one of the things we have to cover. And I don't, I don't get the sense it's something, you know, we'll probably have a separate meeting just to sort of discuss with amongst ourselves first what it is we might want to do before we bring you back to follow up. Um, I'm thinking that probably makes the most sense, uh, or I don't know if folks want to do this on their own. I guess I should get the pulse of the group and see if we want to try to sort of collaborate on an approach or do folks feel like you want to focus more on your specific community. And I know Tom is not here. So Chris, I guess, and Adele, I'm kind of looking to you two, what you think. Well, uh, I personally think that uh, us working together with Amherst would make the most sense. Um, and of course, with Pelham as well. So I don't, I don't see the value of us working separately. Yeah, I'm going to say the um, <clears throat> the way this group has liked to work in the past is to take the document and put it into Google Docs. Is that it? Google Docs? Yeah, we can't do that now, though. <laughs> we can't do? Oh, because of open meeting? Mm -hmm. we, we can find our, our way to mm -hmm. work on it, but we'll just have to work on it together as a group. You know, yeah, our meetings... Yeah, I, I, that's kind of how our meetings have been, though. I mean, we share the document. It might be on Google Docs for people to do um, separate editing on their own, but we can't, certainly you, Tom, and I at least can't go in and sort of make suggestions or change anything outside of public session unless we provide them, you know, just directly with no communication. I think it's just easier. We can just do it together. Darcy. Yeah, I, Stephanie, I'm assuming you have a long uh, list that we could use for outreach for Amherst and local energy advocates, you know, when we were preparing for the for the Ithaca presentation, we um, we put together a pretty huge uh, list that has a page for each community and so we can uh, share that uh, Great. as far as, you know, key key groups that we reached out to. Um, so yeah, to the extent that would be helpful or, you know, we can do some of the reaching out, presumably. I don't know, I'm offering things that have not been okayed with the other two, <laughs> two board members that are in this meeting. Okay with me. <laughs> so what I, I mean, does it make sense that we, our next meeting doesn't have to be with Paul and, and team because um, uh, it's I, you basically you've handed off our task to us, right? Um, the first the first thing is this this document, and maybe you know we take a short meeting and go over a couple sections just to kind of get our ideas of where do we want to go with it. We all go off and we work on our own parts to it. We meet again and we put it together. Go to the next section. Just kind of take the document and work through it um, section at a time or multiple sections at a time. Um, so that we're doing everything in the public, except for mm -hmm. our own personal piece. Yep. Um, Does that sound workable? Tom is, yeah, Tom is here and I'm going to, Tom, I'm going to allow you to talk. I don't, I'm trying to promote you to panelists, but you don't seem to be getting in. So I'm just going to allow you to talk. If you want to jump in here. You're muted, Tom. 
He may be working still. Okay. So Tom, we can't hear you. I'm just going to assume that you're maybe um, doing double duty here. So um, I have a question um, for the team here. Uh, how how have other communities handled this once you've presented this document? Have they gone off and worked on it separately and then come back to you? Typically, yes. Right. Thanks. Yep. So Darcy. I just have a quick question. I'm, I guess I'm hoping that's, that we can we can do it so that we don't hold your process up um, so that we're, you know, working in parallel. And so I guess I'm wondering, I think Paul said that he thought that we would be ready to submit in like four months or something, three or four months. So yes. working backwards, can we figure out somehow figure out like how fast we have to work in order to accomplish that so that we're not, you know, like slowing things down? Paul, go ahead. Um, yes, so absolutely. So that I mean the timing to filing is it's it's mostly, you know, it's the schedule is driven mostly by you guys. So our we can we can we can work around you the just kind of just thinking it through out loud for a second here so in order to take the next formal step which is um um the public presentation of the plan in the three communities we have to have a total of four documents complete one is the education and outreach plan and that's the one that requires the most input from you and that's the one we've been talking about and that's why we started with that one the, the next is the aggregation plan itself. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. Um, that's largely DPU prescribed. It has just a few places where your input is required, and that's mostly around um, the renewable energy content and what you want the products to, to look like. So we can either talk about the decisions there in isolation which is usually how we do it, or we could give you a draft of the document with sort of an annotated draft similar to the education and outreach plan. Um, and then the other documents is the electricity supply contract. And I think probably what makes sense there is if we get that to you, you typically what communities do is they have their town council review it ahead of time to be sure they're comfortable with it. That can take a little bit of time. So be good to have that in process and we can send you the documents you need to get that in process. And then the final key document is the opt-out letter, um, which again, kind of flows from other decisions, but um, Marlene, what would be the best way, good timing for presenting that, that letter? Um, well, that, that flows from decisions around program options and program option names. Um, so typically once those decisions are made, I can get a draft of that letter to yellow. Okay, well, so if, if we if we do take any of these documents on and, and kind of work on them in sections and it, so that we end up with pieces that are finished, does it help to pass those on to you guys? That doesn't sound like it does, but I thought I would ask. For, for this particular document, it would sure. be great to just get kind of the, the whole thing. Um, I think working on it in sections makes sense. I also find it helpful to see the document as a whole because as I mentioned, there's often stuff that you you want to duplicate in two places. And so you should make sure that you're expressing it the same way in two places. There's gonna be some similarity between what you do for the public presentation of the plan and what you do around the program launch announcement. It's two announcements that you put out. So announcement publicity will be similar. Maybe you're not gonna have public information sessions, plural, with the public presentation of the plan, and you are going to have plural later, and you're not going to have a mailing with that first thing, but you are later, so they're not going to be identical. But there's going to be some stuff that should be pretty much the same, a few elements. And so I find it's useful to look at the document as a whole and say, you know, are we, are we saying we do we do press releases one way here, but we do them a different way over here? You know, we we do this thing one way here, but we do it different. We don't want to do that. Um, the DPU gets tripped up on things like that. So. I would say having the whole document is most useful. Okay. Um, that makes sense. 
No, it does. So, I, I'm, 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 I'm not surprised by that. <laughs> I'm just seeing us as doing what we've been doing, which is convening and starting at the beginning. It would certainly be helpful for the three communities, especially to bring their contacts and outreach resources to the meeting. So that would be our homework ahead of time so that we're not, there may be some overlap, but making sure that we're sort of have our, at least a general list to begin with from each community to the next meeting. Does that seem okay, Chris and Tom? I'm not quite following you, Stephanie. A list so of... if we have a list of who our typical outreach agencies are, who we oh, typically okay. go through. Okay. Um, you know, and sometimes they do include additional agencies. Um, so we might want to just bring what, what does Northampton typically do? We have a communications director. So basically I'll just be going to her and saying, here's what we're working on. What do you see is, you know, the usual outreach that we do. I feel like if we get those basics down from each community, then we can sort of talk about how we might want to expand upon that. Um, does that sound like an okay strategy for folks? I'd, Tom? I'd it's okay, it's okay for, for me. Star, sorry, Stephanie, I'm having a heck of a time here. I, I'm getting most of it, uh, what you're saying. And yes, your strategy sounds good to me. I'll, I'll commit to that. Okay, and Chris, I'm sorry. Go ahead, you were starting to say something. Yeah, I could bring that information. I mean, I think what's, I'm, I, I, mean, I know I haven't read the document yet, so that might be one reason why, but I'm thinking an initial meeting to kind of talk about well, what piece do we want to, um, you know, bite off, and what do we want to accomplish? What do we want to fit in there? This is going to be needed, but bring this information before we have that initial meeting is still fine. I think that's a way to start because sure. that's going to be one of the first things that we have to provide. Okay. I have looked through the document, so that's why I brought that one up because okay. it's, it's the first piece. And I'm very jealous that Amherst has a communications person. <laughs> Northampton does not. Yeah, she's really great too, Darcy. Yeah, I just would say that it seems like the outreach document isn't particularly controversial. It seems like it we should be able to finalize that pretty fast. I think my personally feel like we just need to make sure it has, you know, some language in there, including the climate justice community, kind of getting outreach to them. Um, but other than that, um, I don't I don't see it as a big barrier to moving forward quickly. It's not a barrier. We just need to be on the same page and be comfortable with it. So right. I just want to make sure that, you know, because what works for Amherst and Northampton may not specifically work for Pelham. So I think we just want to make sure we're clear on what we're providing because we do have to be specific is what I understand. Yeah, basically just kind of grunt work. Yeah. We need not... we need to pull the stuff out and put it together. Right. Yeah. So so the next meeting, so what I'm suggesting is just we bring that information to the next meeting, each community. Who who are your usual points of contact for outreach? And I'm sure we'll all have like the same news agencies and all that kind of thing. For me, it's more just the additional communities. And as um Darcy noted environmental justice communities, but also, um, you know, I want to make sure that we're reaching, um, you know, really specifically making sure we're reaching rent the rental community and others. And I think there's agencies that we can partner with to get the information out as well. So any other comments there? No. Okay. So I, I sort of feel like we have our next step that we need to do, which I think we would do on our own. And then maybe, um, I guess I would forward to you all, I guess to you, Marlena, um, what we come up with. And then would we come back, you know, then have a schedule a meeting after that? So I guess you could do it a couple of ways. If you come up with a document and there are and you want to send it to me and there are questions embedded in it, we can mm -hmm. handle that electronically potentially. I don't know what your uh, requirements are around public transparency, but many groups will, will deal with it that way. They'll, they'll send me a file and they've added their stuff. And then they've also got a bunch of questions like, you know, what about this? Or is this okay? Or why is this in here? And I can, I can, we can resolve that 
by email, if that works, that's one option, or we can come back together and discuss those things. Um, if, if you want to do things uh, in parallel, another, well, slightly parallel, another option is we handle the document revisions via email and the next meeting is to discuss the next, the set of decisions you have to make around like program options and things, because we do need that information in order to draft the aggregation plan and work on the letter itself. So again, it kind of depends how you, how we resolve the document might influence what happens in the next meeting. So we could use the next meeting to talk about the document, or we could say from now on the documents handled electronically and the next meeting is, is addressing those, those decisions and talking about those. So I think I'm more comfortable doing it publicly because I don't want to run into any potential open meeting conflict. So I would think we would want to do it in open meeting, but I think if we provided the questions to you ahead of time, you answered them and then we discussed them, it seems like that would be a, a quicker review and that would allow us to get on to the sort of next steps discussion sure. as well. So are people okay with that approach? Okay, great. So it sounds like I am, we have. I am, yeah. Okay, yeah, thanks, sorry. Tom. No, I'm glad you. I'm, I'm glad you jumped in. So it sounds like we have our next steps then, which will be for us to look through the education and outreach document. Um, we'll come with our uh, typical usual outreach list. Uh, we'll work that out. We will draft something and get it to you. If we have questions, we are very good about making notations in documents with our questions. So we will definitely provide those questions as part of the document. Um, and then if you all would review it, and then we schedule a follow-up meeting to discuss uh, the answers, you can answer them and send it to us electronically, and then we can discuss those responses and then next steps. Okay, that sounds good. That sounds good. So um, unless there are other questions for Mass Power Choice, I feel like um, you all could jump off and then we just have housekeeping stuff like approving our minutes from the last meeting, which you don't have to sit through. So does anyone else have a question for folks or Paul, go ahead. Yes, yeah, so I just wanted to ask Darcy. So I think we've, we've, we've made great progress on the education and outreach plan and have great um, outline, good next steps for to get that finalized. I'm kind of building on Darcy's question of earlier though, for us to be working on the other things in parallel, there's really just mostly what we need from you is a discussion around the structure of the program and the program options. Um, if there were more time today, and it was, I think it was on your, um, the note, the agenda you posted. So mm -hmm. if there was more time today that we could spend another five or 10 minutes together, maybe a discussion of that would at least give us um, enough of us understanding for us to move ahead on, on the plan, on the aggregation plan document and the letter. Absolutely. Um, so I, th and I think the easiest way to tee that up, if folks are comfortable with it, is we could just share a one or two of the slides we we presented last time, which tee up those questions, and we could talk about them. We didn't last time. I think we went through a whole bunch of stuff, so we didn't really get to dig in on the questions. But um, maybe we could do that. We could do that now. That would be great. Um, and yes, if you would share your screen, and Paul, if you could get me those specific slides, just so I can add it to the packet for today. Yeah, you bet. So that'd be great. Let me um, let me share my screen. All right, do folks see the slide that says program options? Um, great, so the, the, key, the key decision really that flows through the plan document is just to be able to um, speak to what, what you would like to have as the options that your program offers the residents. Very commonly, it's a three part, there are three options that are offered. And there's a standard product that has some amount of additional renewable energy above the required amount. There's an option that's 100%. And then there's an option that has no extra renewable energy, which is available at a lower cost. That's a typical way to do it. It's not the only way to do it. Some communities have no extra renewable energy in the standard. Other communities don't offer the budget, the low cost budget option. Um, some communities have four options, not three. So you have choices around that, but we would need in the aggregation plan to 
articulate these options and you don't even need to give us a final decision today, but if you gave us some direction today, that would be, that would be super helpful for us. Well, given that we haven't discussed it um, in our, in, as a group, uh, it, it, I'm kind of at a loss uh, other than to express my own personal um, preferences, uh, how, we would, how we would let you know that. I'll jump in and, and say, I'd be interested to hear what people's personal preferences are. Um, and it's good to hear that we can adjust these because I think I could give you my opinion, but I would want to go back and kind of think it through and kind of check it out and make sure I would stay with that. And so how about this? How about we all share our very quick personal opinion and we sort of maybe go with whatever the sort of majority consensus seems to be and knowing that we can change them, we can discuss them at the next meeting. Great. Good with that. Mm -hmm. So are you gonna call on people? So yes, so just give me, I'm gonna sort of, yeah, I'll call on folks. So uh, I guess I'll start with you, Adele. Uh, I really love the three options. The, the real question is how we define within each of these. I mean, I love the 100% renewable option, but uh, we're still debating about, you know, RECs versus PPA, et cetera. So, uh, you know, that, that's to be determined. Uh, I would like the standard green product to offer um, double the amount as is it currently in the RPS. How about budget? Budget would be the same, uh, the, the uh, matching the RPS requirements. And, and I'll just jump in, Stephanie, if I could, for yep. the purposes of the plan, you, you, it's because in case I didn't explain this before, you don't need to decide like how much extra is in the standard. You need to, you can decide that later after your plan is approved and after you have price bids, so you know how much the extra would cost. So you don't need to go all the way to saying how much. Really what you need to decide is, do we want our standard to have, for example, you would decide, we want our standard to have some extra. We want an option that has a whole lot extra, or maybe we want an option that's 100%. And then we either do or we don't want an option with zero extra but it's only that level of decision-making that you need to make at this, at this stage. Okay, um, Darcy? Uh, yeah, I would agree with Adele about the 100% option. I personally would like to call our standard option local green, like uh, Cape Light Compact does, um, with much more double or whatever, a lot more than the RPS. And I would like a budget um, program. I'm also interested in knowing if there are other innovative options out there that we don't know about that could also be interesting. Okay, um, I will go to Andra. Um, I really need to understand more. Um, I feel like I need a, a, some schooling, even though we've been talking about this and, you know, studied what recs are and everything. Um, I, I, I still have questions. I feel like there's gaps in my knowledge that I need to understand in order to have a strong opinion, but um, given what I do know um, that a hundred percent entails Rex, there's no way to get to a hundred percent without Rex. Um, then I don't know, I, I, I question what our goal would be. And, you know, there's that old idea that we might be able to bank some of the um, 
income for a big project. And that might not be possible under the current DPU, but maybe in the future. It, so, so you just want more time to think about it. And help. <laughs> I got a lot of understanding to do. Okay. And could use help understanding. Well, like we said, we can sort of have a sort of general idea today and then uh, discuss it again. So, um, Chris, I'm going to jump to you. All right. <clears throat> I go with the three that we have in front of us. Um, maybe modify standard green, but then I want to add a fourth. Um, so the impression I have is a standard green and 100% renewable are going to be all buying recs. That's what's going to produce the amount over. But there's also alternative heating recs and demand recs. There are other um, um, types of recs that I would like to see if we can take advantage of those by, by supporting stuff local. So I would almost want to have, instead of having to have standard green be local green, um, I think I'd like to have a fourth that would be local green. Um, <clears throat> um, and I, and it's, that's the one that is the hardest to be able to say, we'll be able to structure something that actually we can do something with. Um, but it's something that I think we, we've been trying to aim for. So I want, I want one that allows us to be creative and play it. Whereas the rest, these, these three right here are great just to get us started, but another one that we can be creative with. I have a question, Paul, if we said that we sort of wanted to start with three and add a fourth, is that, does that give you enough? Um, it, it absolutely does. And I was, um, I was thinking, I was, I think I was really liking the way Chris was talking about it just then, because from the, what we're trying to do sort of stepping back for a second is, is give the, the, in the plan say enough that you have enough flexibility to do what you want later without having to go through a whole bunch of more regulatory review. Where you really run into trouble with the DPU is if you say we want to op offer two options and then decide later you want to offer a third one, then they make you come back again and it takes a year out of your life and it's, it slows you way down. It's terrible. So it's on, okay, go ahead, though, sorry. We don't, we don't need, you don't need to say, we're going to, we want four options and they're all going to be available on day one. We could, Chris's idea was a great one. We could absolutely say, we're going to have, we're planning to have four. We expect three to be available on the start. And then the fourth will, will become later, but here's what, here's what we're thinking about. Um, we could do that. Okay. So I'm just going to jump in and say, I like that approach. <laughs> so I'm just going to go with that. Sam, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, first I had a clarifying question for Paul. Um, when we commit to a supply that has additional renewable content above RPS, does that additional content have to come from RECs or could it be RECs PPA or virtual PPA? Mm. So that's a, that's a really good question there. So um, the DPU, and we're kind of going back and forth on this with the DPU now where there with some of the plans we have pending where we've said, you know, the renewable energy content may come from class one recs, but it may also come from other things. Um, the DPU is trying to push to people to specify that more. So I think what we'd have to do is, is go into it, describing it in a way that you, we were flexible, but anticipate that the DPU may push back and ask you to nail it down. So we'd have to be clear though, what we mean. Correct. So, but if, if we say, and this is, we've tried to get away with it this way, otherwise is if we say Rex, but not class one Rex, then that covers a lot. So as, you know, as Chris was saying, you know, there are other kinds of Rex and even a PPA or a VPPA, you're going to be getting Rex depending on where the generator is, there may or may not be class one Rex, but there's still going to be Rex is going to be part of what you get. So we may be able that that may give us enough wiggle room, but um, without without going on too long about like the, the intricacies of the DPU requirements, let me try, I can try to draft something up, 
the proposed plan for you that gives you the same the flexibility that Sam was just talking about. We'll put that in, and you know what I recommend is let's let's try that. Let's see if it works. Um, recognizing that we may get pushed to become more more specific. Okay, I want to let Tom weigh in as well. Oops, Stop sorry, me, do. I was just going to give my thought based on Paul's response and thanks for that response, Paul. I think that I agree with others, um, at least three tiers where the standard is a, somewhat above RPS and then you have an optional higher tier that's going to be a lot more renewable content and you have an optional lower tier that's going to match the RPS. And I think I'm also think it's a good idea to have a fourth option or have the flexibility for a fourth option if we ultimately determine that that would be a good thing to have like to be decided. Yep. Okay, thanks, Sam. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there. Not at all. Um, Tom? Yeah, I can be uh, very quick. I'm behind Adele's proposal and uh, I love Sorry, you're breaking up, Tom. I'm your inner witness for Texas program. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Tom, you're. We can't really hear you, Tom. Your audio is. What, a, out there. Um, what about having so, him uh, added? Sounds to, great to me. Is there a chat function? I guess. I, I'm, I'm in a, can you I hear me? Yeah, now we can. Now yes. we can. Yes, we couldn't before, but now we can I'll hear be you back. clearly. Now uh, you can hear me. Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> I'll come out of witness protection. <laughs> uh, I, I, I I was trying to be short and simple. I'm behind Adele's uh, proposal, I, and I I'm very supportive of uh, you know putting in the. Uh, uh, amendments that Chris and Sam articulated so well. Okay. All right. So um, it sounds like we, we um, have come to an agreement that we are all interested in the three, three options with the potential for a fourth that's more uh, local and that that can be something we develop further down the road. So unless there's any um, other thoughts on that, does anyone disagree? Stephanie, I was just gonna clarify, maybe even within those three options, you could potentially have something more local. It sounds like there's flexibility there. So maybe just leaving that sort of as an open-ended dialogue, you know? Yep. Does that work for you, Paul? I mean, I think we all would, we, we would like within the first, you know, within the three, options for them definitely for there to be local as part of those three options um Is yeah so you, you wouldn't be prevented from that and and i'm thinking what you mean by local is like really local so yes. really nearby you know often the way that term is used for ccas local means new england which is good it's not texas but it's not not next door either so um I'm thinking you're you're you've got a, a priority for things that are that are really close, and insofar as that's available, those could that that those local resources could be blended into the options with additional renewable energy in them, and we could still hold out the the possibility of a fourth option that was dedicated truly local. We could we could do that as well. Yeah, I think we like the idea of a really truly local option. So. Okay, um, if everyone's good with that, then Paul, it sounds like you have some feedback to move forward. Yes, absolutely. So that's right. that's really helpful on this issue. There are a couple of others that I think in the interest of time, we'll go through more quick. Well, I mean, I have a talk as long as you want, but we could go through more quickly potentially. So one is um, the uh, names for the options. That might be too much to try to decide today. Um, and at least for the aggregation plan, I can just use placeholder names. Um, these are examples of the types of names. Often folks in other communities have really strong opinions about these names. So 
we need a little time to talk those through. Um, but we can get going on uh, using just placeholders and fill in the actual names later. The other key decision was whether to have the adder. And we did talk about that some last time. And, and I think the takeaway is you're definitely interested in that. We draft up the plan to include the adder. Um, and then we can have maybe a more detailed discussion about exactly how you would use it, but we would write it in a way to try to make, to give you some, some flexibility about how you used it. There is no question that we want the adder. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Um, so that, that's great. So I think with that, we can, you know, we can do a draft aggregation plan for you that includes the options we've discussed. We'll use generic names, we'll include the adder, we'll try to build out that language for you. Um, and then if, if you'd like, given um, some of the questions we could, also as part of a follow-up, we could dig in, we'd be happy to dig in a little deeper on the renewable energy market, what different options might be for the community, both, communities both immediately and what might be more available longer term. So if it would be helpful to have a more organized discussion of that with, you know, with slides and everything, as opposed to me just blathering away, we could, we could certainly do that at, a, at, a, at an upcoming meeting. That would be very helpful. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. All right, so I think that's I'm trying to. Uh, sorry, just struggled to unshare there for a second. This, and Paul, don't worry about sending the slides because we had them in the presentation, so we're good. Okay, great. Um, anybody have any other questions? Or is there anything else you need from us? Uh, go ahead, Darcy. Do we need to say anything specific about the adder or can we just say that we would want an adder because isn't there, isn't that also something that could be larger or smaller and, or, or can we just generally say that we'll be looking for that? Um, uh, so that's a good question. So the way it works is what we have to say in the plan is the maximum amount you would collect. You can always collect less than that, or you could collect none if you decided, but you need to set a max that will be set in the plan. And then you also need to say how you would use it. So you could say things like, you know, administrative costs, that kind of thing, staff position, that kind of thing. I think there's a real interest here uh, in, you know, supporting a local project, you know, local rec. So we, we put that in, we may or may not get some pushback from the DPU to get really specific about some of those uses. Some uses they say, yeah, 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 fine. Other uses they say, well, tell me what you mean by that exactly and give me a budget and stuff like that. So that's something, uh, the degree of specificity we might, we'd have to work out through the DPU review process. And I, I'm assuming for the max that what you would want to collect is the what's the typical amount, um, which would be about 100 and result in about $125,000 a year for you guys. We could ask for more if you wanted. Um, it'd be a little bit harder burden though to to get that approval. Whereas if it's a typical amount, that should shouldn't uh, raise any problems. Anybody else? Um, Adele and then Andra. Oh, uh, I think Andra was first. Okay, sorry. Go ahead, Andra. Um, so we worked on a draft aggregation plans, which I think you might have now. We sent it to Paul, the draft that, um, I'd sent it a while ago that we had sent to you. We had worked on it and then I had forwarded it. Do you have that? I, I do. So I'll, I'll look through that more carefully. Um, there has been an evolution in the requirements for those plans mm -hmm. since you wrote that. And in particular, since the plan, you, yours was based on the Cambridge plan, I think. 
So that was, which was, we helped write, but that was several years ago now. So the rules are a little bit different now. So I'll, I'll definitely review the plan you did. Um, let me ask, and, and I'll certainly, we'll certainly incorporate everything, anything that seems unique in there. Let, <coughs> let me ask whether um, you're, you're particularly committed to the format of that plan. The, the only reason I ask is that the Cambridge plan, which is a good one, is, is non-standard. So most everybody does, their plan is organized in a very specific, in a particular way. Cambridge likes to do things their own way. So they just like reorganize things a bit. Um, did, were you, did you look at all a whole bunch of plans and say, wow, what Cambridge did is way better. We're gonna use that model. Or did you just use Cambridge as a good model, but not specifically choosing that model over others? I think that we mostly used it because we thought it would have more of the content similar to ours, mm -hmm. not for the format. Got it. Okay. Yes, because that, like you, they're a com community that wants to be a, wants to be aggressive in this area. Got it. Okay. So I will definitely incorporate. Um, use that as as an those elements in the plan i might stick if it's right with you with the more standard structure that makes it a little easier for the dpu too because it's more familiar with what you know designed similarly to what they've seen before so it's easier for them to see what's different i think we are just looking for you to look at what we have that might be um sort of like cambridge a little more aggressive and a little more uh, beyond the standard. So, mm -hmm. but as far as formatting and all of that, I think we completely defer to you. So however you see it best to put that together. Adele? Yeah, I was wondering, um, I don't remember what terminology was used, but in, in this document that you sent, uh, there was something about disclosure and you mentioned um, that different suppliers that the suppliers were didn't provide the information in a very user-friendly way, which doesn't surprise me at all. But it also implied that different suppliers would uh, be have a, have a different energy mix, um, and uh, and that that was very intriguing to me because, as you know, I'm trying to understand what is the difference between different suppliers. Um, and, um, and so I'm, I'm just wondering whether that in your experience, you've seen that different suppliers disclosure of their energy mix is, is in fact different. Well, so just, I think this is related to my description of the disclosure label earlier, earlier in this meeting. And I did not mean to suggest that they were presenting the energy mix in a different way. They present the label, they format the label in different ways. Oh. So where where they put the uh, residual mix and where they show voluntary renewable energy purchases, how those are organized can be very different from supplier to supplier. But those elements are present uh, from supplier to supplier. It's really just how each supplier chooses to render them visually. If there's anything written that you could provide to us that we could study in, uh, to understand better this whole world of suppliers, that would be very helpful. Thanks. I mean, isn't it true that you could you can get a supplier whose list of is going to include 100% uh, wind from Texas? And others are going to do we're going to do 100% hydro. Um, I mean, I, you're not going to get 100% hydro, but you need to hit the RPF standard, so whatever it is, but it it doesn't have to be the same source. If someone's got a really good deal on solar, they're going to include a lot more solar in their mix. Um, uh, if I'm right, and if for the non-green part of this renewable portfolio standard, you know there might be I don't know, a different mix of gas versus coal versus oil. Am I correct? I mean, it's basically what they can, they're, they're trying to find their cheapest source and then pass that on to you competitively. They, they are trying to find their cheapest source for sure. Um, and you are correct in the, in the first part that the voluntary recs, the recs they buy can differ. 
Um, if they're class one recs, just, just focusing on class one, for example, you know, they might buy all wind or they might buy a mix of wind and some of the other class one eligible resources. So that would show some differences in the, in the labels. But the, for the underlying electricity, they're all just buying generic electricity because electricity, as you were saying before, the electricity and the rec, the electrons and the recs are sold separately. So all rec electrons are exactly the same. And the only difference is what recs they buy. As Marlena pointed out, if they all did the labels the same way, that would be clear from looking at the labels, but everybody does the labels differently. And so it creates the impression that these things are all different when they're actually the same. It's kind of like little kids on Halloween. They're all little kids, but one looks like a pumpkin and somebody else looks like a wizard, but they're actually all just little kids. <laughs> okay. All right, um, anything else? Okay, I think, um, so Paul and team, thank you so, so much. Um, we'll follow up uh, with our draft education and outreach feedback on, on our outreach. And uh, I think we'll just schedule the next meeting. Uh, we'll, assuming two weeks, I may not be available that Friday. So I think I might have to doodle poll folks. Um, uh, I'll discuss it with the committee afterwards, but then I'll reach out to you, Paul, I guess, primarily. Sure, that's fine. Yeah, for yeah, the next meeting. Sure, absolutely. Okay. I mean, we're going to have a meeting before we, before we meet back with you. So I guess our meeting with you might be in like a month or so, sounds like. Is that too long or is that okay? Um, no, we work at your schedule. We have things we can do behind the, in parallel. And as we have those done, we'll send them off to you. So we'll get you a draft plan that you can review. In fact, if you're thinking you're, you're going to be meeting again in two weeks, we'll make that a deadline for us to get you a draft plan and to try to get you a, a template for the electricity supply agreement. And we'll send those with emails that explain how they fit in and what the next steps would be. Okay. That might, if you give us more information, that's gonna make for a longer meeting. Because <laughs> I think we have to get through the education and outreach plan first. <laughs> and we'll hold off and we'll send them to you after. So that. maybe we'll say a meeting in a month and if we can get them, you know, get that information then that would be great. Excellent. That sounds fantastic. Okay. Um, well, thank you all so much. We're going to all stay on just to do our housekeeping, like I said earlier, just to review our minutes and check in about our next meeting. So um, unless anyone has any other questions, and Paul, Marlena, Julie, Kim, you all are free to go. And thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having uh, us. Thank Great you. To talk to you all. Thank sure. you. Have a lovely weekend. Stay you cool. Too. Stay, Stay cool. Stay cool if that's possible. <laughs> Bye. Okay. Alrighty. Um, so thanks, folks. This is really exciting to be moving along like this now, finally. So um, I don't know. I just there's so much possibility. <laughs> it's really great. So I guess we'll just go to the minutes. Um, I'm not going to display them unless you really want me to. Do you, is there anyone, it's really Tom, Chris, and I that need to approve them. So Tom and Chris, do you, have you looked at them? Do you need me to display them? I'm a I've trusting. looked at them. Yeah, go ahead, Chris. I'm a trusting soul. Darcy's done a great job so far. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, Darcy, thank you so much. Um, yes, thank you. Definitely. <laughs> Makes it very easy to go through them and approve them. Great. I did do some editing just because um, just there, I, I take out hyperlinks, Darcy, uh, just FYI, and Andrew too. We don't have hyperlinks in minutes, so I do take them out, but I'd leave the um, URL where possible. So, um, okay, well, uh, then I, do I have a motion to approve the minutes from the meeting on the, whatever that date was, the 8th? So moved. And, okay, so voice vote, Mason? Yes. Thompson? Yes. Chicarello, yes. Okay, minutes are approved. Um, so for our next meeting, I'm just looking at dates. Um, 
where are we? Today's the 22nd. So the next meeting would potentially be the 5th. And I think I'm going to be away um, on that Friday. It's not definite yet, but it's a strong possibility. So, excuse me, is there another day that week that might, would the 4th maybe work for people? Oh, that's a Thursday, so that doesn't work for you, Darcy? Uh, not during the day, no. I will be gone the first to the third. Actually, I'll be gone from the 27th to the third. I'll be oh. back on the fourth. Okay, so you're away the 27th through to the third. Tom, what about you? Just so I know, do you have any plans to be away within between now and then? Uh, no, just work related travel, but um, uh, I generally can. Generally, I can figure it out. Um, earlier in the day is always a little better, it seems. Okay, Darcy, if we, um, it, it sounds like if we can get the staff here on the fourth, because otherwise I think we'd be looking to, um, the week of the eighth. It was early in the week of the eighth. Yeah, if you if you have to meet on whatever that day is, um, you know, I I might be able to get my daughter to cover or something. You know, I think I'd I'd rather meet on the eighth than the fourth, Stephanie. Just knowing I'm going to be back from vacation and have to scramble to get something ready by the fourth or get ready before I leave. I think I'd rather. So my, uh, this is just really my schedule and it's making me feel like I can't do what I want to do. The, so I would be gone the fifth through the eighth. Oh, I see. So, um, and then I'm gone the entire week of the 15th. What about the 10th? Yeah, I'd be fine with the 10th. <clears throat> so we could do the 10th. Um, Tom, does the 10th work for you? It's a Wednesday. It, I think that was a yes. It can. I'm going to be in Utah. Signal again. Hello. Oh, Wednesday, okay. the 10th. We can you hear you. So I'm going to be in Utah. Um, so if we could do it earlier in the day, preferably 9 o'clock local time here would be better for me. Um, the 10th could work. Nine o'clock local time, you're in Utah? No, local time for here on the East Coast. Okay, so nine, nine EST. EST, yes. EST, that's what I got. Yes. Okay. okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. I think I can do that. Um, does that possible? work for others? Tom, how, is it much worse to do 10? Well, the, the, my work day will start out there and I'm traveling for business. So, in a way, it, it, it is. Sorry. <laughs> do you have a conflict andra yeah adela and i have another meeting but um we can one of us skip it or both yeah um are we talking about a one hour meeting typically our meetings had been for an hour um i think what we would this is going to be to discuss the education and outreach plan. So the three communities need to go through and identify their standard outreach. And then we were going to come together as a group and discuss, and there's going to be a lot of overlap. So I think we're just right, be, right. going to be sort of filling in those additional agencies or organizations that we think we should include as part of our outreach. Yeah, I don't think it's going to be long to do the, the plan because most of us can be, you know, we're, we're going to go back and do most of it ourselves. We're just going to kind of strategize what do we want to get done and then come back and no i thought the idea was to prepare it ahead of time Pre prepare information ahead of time come to the meeting with information but not already blended in. yeah we're not going to blend it in until we all discuss it right <laughs> so that we're putting together we're basically going through and putting the document together while you know real time So it could be, I mean, potentially that could be 
how about we give it an hour and a half? <laughs> and I know, um, Tom, you may have to bail, but. What about Friday the 12th then? Um... I, that's too late. And I've got another solar bylaw working group meeting that day. And okay. that's a big lift. I've just got, yeah, Thanks. too much. Yeah. Well, um, maybe uh, Tom could trust us to receive whatever information he's gathered in, from Pelham. And then we could meet on the 10th later in the day. And I would. I'm, I, I would like to have Tom there, quite frankly. Um, that'd, that'd be great. I just don't know how we're going to get around his schedule and ours. Well, his, I mean, if we start at nine, we would have him from at least nine to 10. Well, and, if we start at nine, we won't have Andrew and me. Well, didn't you both just say that maybe one of you at least could? Maybe, um, maybe, but um, it's certainly not ideal. Yeah, I, I think we're never going to get everybody. And I, I think I just think at this point, you know, having the three communities because we have to actually vote. Um, I feel like it's really important to make sure that we have them. And Tom is, we wouldn't even have Tom for the whole meeting. So I don't feel like I have to be at this meeting anyway. It, it's kind of not strategy or it's just yeah i mean it's literally just identifying maybe some organizations and you could even send like if you have ideas about organizations take a look at the education and outreach plan ahead of time and maybe send them we to have me. It. darcy mentioned already leah has a whole list we can yeah see. and you've got it so you could just forward to us what you have and then at least if one of you are available at that meeting to you know I don't know that we're going to include every single organization because remember, if we list it, we have to do at least what we list. We can't do less. We can always do more. So I don't. I think we want to be really. We don't want to overpromise and then not be able to deliver. So, yeah, that's why I think the document doesn't really matter. <laughs> yeah, and some more. Yeah, really, yeah. that's true. But it's a lot of grunt work. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but I'm just gonna. I have to ask. So no one mentioned Tuesday the ninth. Is there a problem with Tuesdays? Darcy's not available Tuesdays and Thursdays. Okay. I was wondering. Okay. I'm, I'm actually not available on the tenth either. But yeah. oh, well then maybe we should go back to the th Thursday before and, and miss you there. Yeah. You Chris, gotta... I know that you don't prefer the fourth. Oh. But... oh. Um, well, I, I just checking in with Chris. Would that be if, impossible? If, if you can accept me not being as prepared as others, I think just you know honestly, even if you just had, I mean, Chris, you know, there's not a lot. I think I think it'd be fine. I mean, if I don't come with my list of outreach because we don't have, I don't have one person to go to. Um, I'm I'm going to have to ask around to find out. You know, where what kind of outreach happens in the city. Um, <clears throat> uh, so if I don't come with that list, I think I could still be fine with having the meeting and I can go find that later on and plug it in. So what I would suggest is in just starting right at the mayor's office when they're oh, doing I will. Yeah, I'm outreach, ask like the starting yeah, I'm, there. I'm going to ask I, the mayor's office. Yep. But I, yeah. I'm just saying that I think that like typically for us, the town manager's office usually goes beyond what other folks might do. So even if that's the only one you, you can get to, it's probably going to be more comprehensive than some of the other groups that yeah, you might I, 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 I can probably come with something. I mean, I have, okay. yeah. So that's good. So. But I don't I think, think it's essential I do have it. I mean, I think we're, we're, we're just going to plug it in um, at some point. And we don't need a group meeting for me to write in the Gazette. <laughs> yeah. Just, well, and we're all going to have, like I said, there's going to be overlap. We're all going to have the same yeah. news channel stations we're going to have the same publications probably um we'll all have our websites great i think you we're know, making social it, media i think it's going to be i think this is going to be it's going to be grunt work but it's going to be fairly straightforward exactly yeah once we get right. into it okay so thursday the fourth then and um time for that one uh Sorry, I'm just looking at my calendar here. 
Tom, do you have constraints on the time on the fourth? I I don't think I do at this point. Although I will say that generally speaking, earlier is better than later. Okay, so I have. I do have a, what is that meeting? Um, oh, I have a meeting at 10. Um, so I could do nine, but I would have to, I would only have an hour from nine to 10. Or I could do 12, I could do noon to one, possibly even noon to two if we had to on the fourth. Preferences? It sounded like um, Tom wanted uh, the 9, uh, 9 a.m. Okay. Makes so it more it, predictable for me. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so it has to be, it'll have to be a one hour, nine to 10, one hour meeting. Okay. All right. All right, I think we're good then. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. All right. So, um, Chris, have a great, safe trip and Tom, all of your safe travels as you normally do. Everybody stay Thank cool. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Then good I weekend, everybody. Keep, have a great weekend. Keep the Thanks, everybody. Everybody. All right. Take care. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.